Welcome to the show that gives you insights on Africa. This week, we're happy to host the Chief Executive Officer of the new Partnership for African Development, NEPAD. He's the former Prime Minister of the Republic of Niger. Dr. Ibrahim Mayaki is with us. We get your views on the issues. You're watching the Africa Leadership Dialogues. I'm Julie Gishur. Dr. Ibrahim Mayaki from the Republic of Niger is the Chief Executive Officer of NEPAD, otherwise known as the New Partnership for Africa's Development. He's based at the Planning and Coordinating Agency, which is headquartered in Midrand, South Africa. Between 1996 and 1997, he was the Minister in Charge of African Integration and Cooperation and Foreign Affairs in Niger. And from 1997 to the year 2000, he served as Prime Minister. Following this, in August 2000, he set up the Analysis Centre for Public Policy. From the year 2000 to 2004, Dr. Mayaki lectured on international relations and organizations and led research at the Research Center on Europe and the Contemporary World. This is based in Paris. He's also worked as a professor of public administration in Niger and Venezuela. In 2004, he was appointed as the executive director of the platform in support of rural development in Western Central Africa, the Rural Hub, based in Dakar, Senegal, from where he was recruited as CEO of the NEPAD agency in 2009. Dr. Mayaki is also an author of a book on his political career. Let's take a look at his insights into development on the African continent and the role of NEPAD. What has it done? Thank you so much for finding time to be with the Africa Leadership Dialogues. It's a now, pleasure. a lot of people on this continent, you ask them, have you heard of NEPAD? We'll say, yes, we have. The following question, what does NEPAD do, might be a problem for them. So let's break it down in the simplest of terms. Um, what is the role? of NEPAD. Thank you for inviting me and let me answer your question by first trying to contextualize historically from where NEPAD is coming. NEPAD was framed as an African response to Africa's marginalization on the global scene in 2001 Africa was coming out of harsh policies in terms of macroeconomic governance. And these harsh policies had a very negative impact on our social cohesion. Our capacity to think for ourselves was almost erased. And we were depending on external partners to tell us what to do in terms of agriculture, infrastructure, health, and education. So NEPAD came as a response to that vacuum in terms of thinking. And the leaders who shaped NEPAD wanted to highlight two key values. The first value was ownership. We should design our own programs and not have them dictated by external partners. And the second value was about governance. If we could enhance our governance systems, make them more inclusive and more efficient, we would really take advantage of the enormous resources we have. So the NEPAD program was framed in that thinking, and it helped between 2001 and 2010, Africa really change its policies, change its continental frameworks, change its regional strategies, and change its national plans. So 11 years after, 12 years after the formulation of Nepal, what do we see? We see Christine Lagarde, the Director General of the IMF, 
saying that Africa's public finances today are better managed than Europe's public finances. We don't have cases like Greece. We don't have to tackle the challenges of deficits that most of European countries are, are tackling. So, and we realized uh, these achievements through increased governance capacities, uh, sound public finances policies, uh, sound taxation policies, uh, sound uh, agricultural and infrastructure initiatives. So NEPAD as a program helped to achieve these objectives in a, in a, in a soft way. Now, evidently, we have challenges for the second decade. We'll come, yeah. we'll come to those in just okay. a moment. You say <clears throat> in a soft way. So I really want to come to the specifics. And I've, I've heard, you know, sitting mm. with President, former president of South Africa, Thabo Mbeki, former mm. president of Nigeria, Ole Seguno Basanjo, mm. speaking of, you know, how this mm. whole idea mm. came to pass. I know Buteflika was involved in this as mm. well, and, and the former president of Senegal as well, Wad. Mm -hmm. And this baby that was birthed, mm. You've, uh, you've said it, 10 years, 11 years in, mm -hmm. this is a transformed continent because we do remember the economist headline, mm -hmm. a hopeless continent. Exactly. And now everybody says Africa is rising. Mm -hmm. But I want you to give us some, some concrete examples of some of the things that you've seen over the past 10 years mm -hmm. that have been implemented and are transformational because we're still trying to capture where did we get it right okay. so that we can also make sure where we're getting it wrong, okay. we're able to start transforming okay. the situation as well. I'll give you just three examples. Um, seven of the fastest growing economies uh, today are African economies, and seven out of ten. Mm -hmm. And uh, amongst the seven fastest growing economies, only two of them are, have based their economic growth on exporting raw materials. The five of us have done it through a diversification of their economy. It is a, a huge step uh, forward. Second example, in 2000, most of our partners, external partners, were telling us, don't invest in agriculture because uh, it is useless the returns will be very low. But uh, through NEPAD, the African heads of state decided to design CADEP, the Comprehensive African Agricultural Development Program. And now out of the 54 African countries, 50 have compacts derived from the CADEP processes, and more than 30 have national plans of investment in agriculture derived from the CADE process, which is a NEPAD process. Prioritizing agriculture in our national planning systems did really lay the basis for the transformation of our economies. Evidently, we still face challenges. Mm -hmm. We face challenges in agriculture of food insecurity, of nutrition, but we are on the right track. We're moving. We are moving. Mm -hmm. The issues related to empowering small-scale farmers, related to protecting our agricultural productions, the issues of looking at agriculture in a multi-sectoral dimension, where infrastructure, rural roads, trade, vocational training are important factors in order to boost the development of the sector, these issues are integrated in our national planning systems. So it is being done softly. It is somehow invisible, but it's invisible like the sugar in water. But the water is sweet, <laughs> and it is becoming sweeter. <laughs> That's mm -hmm. a powerful mm -hmm. analogy. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, the third example? Yeah. The third example is about infrastructure development. In, uh, from 1960 to the 2000s, we were thinking about infrastructure development on a national basis. And we realized 
but uh, our infrastructure problems do not have national solutions. They have regional solutions right. in energy, in transport, roads and rail, in uh, IT. They have regional solutions. So that awareness of the optimal regional solutions compared to suboptimal national solutions was really picked by our heads of states. And that is what has helped us as Nepal design the program of infrastructure development in Africa, which consists in key regional projects on which African countries do agree based on corridors, you see. So most of our regional projects today are uh, supported by national governments who do interact between themselves in order to facilitate their implementation. It can be the Nigeria, Niger, Algeria gas pipeline, the Brazzaville, Kinshasa bridge with a road and the rail, the north-south corridor, and uh, the development corridors that we have in, in um, uh, East Africa. So the awareness that if we want to solve uh, the issues related to energy access, we need to go through regional projects like the INGADA are uh, really picked and integrated in our national planning processes. And it is a huge revolution in terms of thinking. And there is an agreement today on very concrete regional projects, about 50 of them, but really, that will boost the connectivity of the, of the continent. Stay with the Africa Leadership Dialogues. What are the greatest challenges, do you think, in terms of development across Africa right now? I think, in my view, we have uh, three main challenges. The first challenge is that we can have sound strategies, uh, good governance systems, but we need a transformative leadership. And when I refer to a transformative leadership, I'm not talking only about the political leadership. I'm talking about the leadership at every level. And that transformative leadership has to be aware of the necessity to count on our own resources. Because Africa today has the sufficient level of resources to really fund its development projects. Uh, we uh, contributed to the finalization of a domestic resources mobilization study with the United Nations Economic Commission for, for Africa. And we found that in the last 12 years, Africa has multiplied its domestic resources by four. So if you look at uh, the figures of the um, Committee on Aid Development of the OECD. Uh, today, less than 60, 60 million Africans live in countries where aid is more important than public resources in financing development. 60 million out of 1 billion inhabitants. Right. It's a huge change. Secondly, uh, you know that President Becky headed a, a, a group that looked thoroughly about the issue of illicit financial flows. These illicit financial flows represent about $55 billion a year coming out of Africa. Generally, in the thinking, in the general thinking, and in the media, general media thinking, people tend to uh, refer to corruption issues, but it's not about corruption. Things corruption like tax is not avoidance as well? exactly right. it's tax avoidance. Okay. It's mainly about multinationals right. who are not paying their taxes and legally so, getting away legally and illegally, and illegally through corruption mechanisms okay. and so on. So we need to invest uh, enormously in strengthening our taxation systems so that we avoid these 
illicit flows. So if you combine the domestic resources that we are mobilizing and these illicit financial flows that we could reduce, we don't have to rely on external partners. Let's talk about your role mm. as, as the head of NEPAD. You've also served the continent in your government mm. in, in, a, in a leadership position. What personal responsibility do you feel in such a critical position? Well, humbly, I, I see my role in two main dimensions. Uh, the first one is to make sure that the implementation of our regional projects takes really place. And for that, uh, we reshaped the NEPAD agency uh, to give it the necessary capacity in terms of project design, resource mobilization uh, processes, monitoring and evaluation. So we need to make sure that implementation takes place on the ground and uh, we are accountable for that and that's where we will be evaluated. Uh, secondly, uh, through our think tank role, we need to change the discourse on Africa. Uh, most Africans are uh, confident about their continent today. Uh, you see it in the ministerial conferences, African ministerial conferences. You see it in our interaction with partners. We have grown in confidence. So uh, this has to be reflected in our discourses because uh, confidence will help us think in an autonomous manner. It doesn't mean that we'll not uh, integrate uh, inputs coming from partners, but we need to think autonomously, just like Asia did. Uh, the, the, uh, Asia uh, built its development systems on a, a confidence in their culture. But there is a difference between Asia and Africa. We are coming from three to 400 years of slavery, 200 years of colonialism, 100 years of post-colonialism, and it eroded our confidence. But now, uh, we see that confidence growing. So it's, and if you look at our young population, they are a full illustration of that confidence. They are not relying on governments. They are not relying on uh, any uh, special thinker. They think for themselves and they want to change the continent. They are transformative leaders. You're encouraged by the youth. I, I, I mm. love that because mm. so often we, we look at the challenges facing the youth population. Mm. But I love that you're enc encouraged by the youth. Um, th the question I would ask around the youth population in Africa, and, and for many of us as well who are not so young, mm -hmm. um, we are still struggling with finding ourselves. There are some who you will ask who will say, there is no notion of Africa. We are too different within our states. Well, what, is, what is this one Africa? You know, um, there are others who say the identity is there, yes, but, but then when you ask who are we between rural and urban populations, older and younger populations, different ethnicities, do you think at the end of it all we can really find a true African identity? I think it's an intuition I have. Um, it's not evidence-based, but that intuition is somehow evidence-based. Uh, I am convinced that uh, the, the social media uh, factors have boosted uh, very efficiently uh, the Pan-Africanist movement. You will find uh, youngsters from Mali uh, following uh, the tweets of uh, Uhuru Kenyatta or the tweets of uh, uh, um, a civil society organization leader in South Africa mm. or uh, following the tweets of uh, Yusundur in, in, uh, right. in, in Senegal. Mm. This is forging a new community which uh, finds that it has common links, 
they don't necessarily think in the same way, but they think they are part of the same community. In uh, the Arab Spring, uh, the social media had a direct impact on how these communities did take in charge their reform processes mm. with good points and less good points. But uh, that silent revolution is really very important and we have not yet measured the consequences that it has had. You know, Africa today on one billion inhabitants, you have mm -hmm. roughly 500 million Africans, maybe a little bit less, who have access to a cell phone. It's a huge transformation, uh, not only at the level of the youth and the constitution of that global community that interacts, but in uh, cases also like uh, farmers who use cell phones to check the prices to of their productions. Yes, yeah. yes. So mm. that technological innovation is uh, conducive to a radically changed context in terms of social cohesion. And we have not really measured that yet, but it will, in my view, produce different governance systems. Because Africa, with its 75% of population under 25, right. with a median age of 19, cannot be governed like a continent like Europe, where the median age is 45. You see, we are the continent of the future. And we will shape these governance systems in a totally radically different way. Incredibly powerful points. And at Africa Leadership Dialogues, we can attest to the fact that this mm -hmm. is happening. The social media space is very dynamic. Mm -hmm. Presidents are accountable even mm -hmm. on social media and respond mm -hmm. to the push. So yes, rapidly changing, mm -hmm. a lot of positivity, but we also have to keep an eye on some of the negativity, mm -hmm. and negativity in this space. Let me pose the question to you now. Mm -hmm. Where do you see this continent in 10 years? In, in 10 years, um, what I see humbly is on three domains. Um, in terms of infrastructure development, we will have moved considerably ahead and key regional projects would have been uh, uh, realized and implemented and that will boost our intra-African trade from the current 12% to about 25%. And Only 25? It's, it's progressive. Can we not be it more ambitious? Be the okay. <laughs> it will be the devil. It will be the devil. I, I tell you what I'm seeing. Yes. Yeah. And 25% will have an immediate impact on uh, our economic growth rates. But we need to make sure that uh, we are relatively egalitarian uh, because the levels of inequality are too high. So we absolutely need to reduce inequality because if we don't reduce inequality, social inequality, we might face uh, governance issues mm -hmm. and issues related to political instability. Mm -hmm. Secondly, uh, we will be food secure because the impact of the CADEP processes beyond prioritizing agriculture has had an impact on agricultural production. Mm -hmm. And at the same time, it is empowering small-scale farmers. You know, small-scale farmers are those who are feeding us, you and I, and all the continent. Mm -hmm. And thirdly, in terms of skills, uh, there will be a huge uh, revolution. Currently, uh, Africa, our universities are producing around 15,000 engineers. China is producing every year 700,000 engineers. But in the next 10 years, uh, my guess, my bet is that we'll move from 15,000 to about 100,000 engineers. And in terms of uh, skills development, it will have a direct impact on the quality of our infrastructure. Right. That's, so 
I, music to my ears. I mean, you know, we start off with the fact that we will be trading more. I wish we could be more ambitious about what we could achieve, but you say double, double what we have today, which is good, uh, between each other, um, that indeed we will be food secure as a continent. Mm -hmm. This is a prayer that many people across the continent have, and, and it's a beautiful dream to hold on to. And then that our skills will be relevant. You've spoken mm -hmm. of engineers, and, mm -hmm. and that is a critical, critical factor uh, that we need to pay more attention to. And, and that, mm -hmm. I guess, involves also education systems mm -hmm. in many of our countries aligning mm -hmm. to the professional needs so, yeah. um, in, in our nation states. We've already come to the end of the interview. Okay. Would you believe it? I want you to look into the camera, please. Mm -hmm and deliver your message to Africa, to the leadership and the citizenry, what must we all do to play a role in transforming the continent? We need to be conscious of the fact that in the next 100 years, we will be the main global player on the global scene. And we can already see the path which we are taking in order to reach that goal. And we will do it in a very innovative way, with innovative governance systems, more inclusive, and with a tremendously innovative young population. And that young population will be the leaders of tomorrow's world. You could be the leaders of tomorrow's world. For some of us, we won't be around in a hundred mm. years. Maybe mm. you won't be either, but this is for our children and our grandchildren. Mm. Let's all do what we can. Thank you so okay. much for making Thanks time. Thanks to you. For